There we go. Welcome, everybody. Happy Friday. Today, Friday, April the 29th, we have one before our last professional development webinar for our spring NSF includes Aspire Alliance cohort. And this is wonderful as we approach the end of the semester and a very successful group that we are happy to have this spring. So today we are going to talk about developing effective lesson plans. And just a friendly reminder that today's webinar is tied to the last deliverable before we have our final portfolio. So remember that you will have to design your own lesson plan as part of your deliverables and include this in your final portfolio. Therefore, it is very important and I will um, suggest that you not only take some notes for today, but only remember that we have the recording and the PDF of the presentation available as soon as we finish the session, and that will be in your resources in Blackboard. So just remember that this is there for you to help you with your deliverable. So that being said, we will begin. And this is our outline for today. We will have the introduction of the main areas of the interaction of developing an effective lesson plan. And this is obviously the students and the faculty and how the perspective of these two main groups have differences because we are basing this in comparison to the two-year institutions and the four-year institutions. And this is, as you know, something that we've been addressing throughout our, 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 um, our semester. Um, to make sure that you all participants know that those differences politically in the climate and the content in the curriculum are, are crucial to understanding and succeeding as emerging faculty at a two-year institution. So some of the important points to mention and consider as you develop your, your lesson plan are the learning outcomes, the student body or who you're addressing, and what are the course contents that you are to cover. Remember that last time we talked not only about what you want to provide as a facilitator of learning, but also what the institution is requiring you to teach or to cover. Um, Dean Villalobos did a wonderful job during our session addressing all of these changes, as you may recall. Then we can talk about the teaching strategies and faculty goals. What are the potentials of teaching at a community college? What differences slash I would say benefits in this case and the experience and the actual action of doing this, the activities in your classroom. Some other points to consider is always adapt the assessment piece and the feedback portions and how can we compare and contrast ebb and flow, which is our ideal versus apprehension as a new faculty or as somebody who has maybe not a lot of um, experience yet developing lesson plans. And of course, we will have a breakout in our concluding remarks. So to start off, we have today our very special guest speaker and webinar facilitator. And this is Dr. Steve Hobbs, which is who's also also a very dear LSM colleague from our uh, UT system team. And he currently serves as division director of STEM and department chair of mathematics and sciences at Howard College, where he's also a professor of biology. And I'm sure he has many other duties that are not listed in this slide. So Dr. Hobbs holds a BS in biology from the University of Texas Permian Basin and a doctorate in chiropractic from Parker College of Chiropractic. He's also been a dean and adjunct professor and a professor at several other institutions, as you can read in the slide. And Dr. Hobbs has extensive teaching experience and also grant management, as well as uh, participation in other community and associations. And of course, like I mentioned, he is our liaison and site director for the UT System LSAMP program at Howard College. So, Dr. Hobbs, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for giving you your time and uh, sharing all of your expertise about lesson plans and action items in the classroom. So, Thanks. go ahead. I appreciate that. Um, so, I'm Dr. Stephen Hobbs. If I talk too quickly, just say, hey, can you slow down? Because I get kind of excited about this. Um, I have uh, 300 and as of yesterday, when I finished another final, uh, 391 upper level credit hours in biology, chemistry, physics, astronomy, uh, 
healthcare sciences, clinical neurology, and a few others. So there's a lot. I've learned what effective teachers are and, and what I try to do is pull from each one of those. I call that emulation. Pull from each one of those and then all of that will kind of go into here, just kind of a blanket. And of course, there's always some gray areas, all right? So with that, um, we're gonna look at the difference between students and faculty. So as a faculty member teaching at a four-year, it's very different than being a student at a four-year. Same thing as if you were at a two-year, it's very different to be a student than a faculty member, okay? Although they, they have an underlying uh, goal, which is you know learning, it's not the same job, okay? So try to shift your feet underneath yourself as we move through this. So there's some pretty big things. So we'll look at the learning outcomes. We'll look at the student body itself and then the course content, and we'll continue down from there. So at a community college, um, try to focus on your students, of course, okay? Um, that doesn't mean that it's, that's not what your focus is at university, but at community colleges, very few people actually do research. Okay? It does happen, but that is not the overall goal because the student bodies are not the same. So as we move through this, all of these slides I've made to fit both the student body, excuse me, <clears throat> the student body and new faculty members. So in case you are considering going into teaching, all of this will fit whether or not you're a student or a faculty member, okay? So it actually functions as both, as kind of an orientation to community colleges or to your institutions and then universities as well. So major differences between these two. One student body, the faculty have different goals between the two institutions, very different goals, okay? At a two-year institution, primarily we teach, that's what we do. And we are not teaching people to be researchers as much as I would love that. I would love it. That is not what we're getting. Okay. So to put it as bluntly, but as nicely as I can, there are, there are students that show up that sometimes they don't read. Sometimes they can't read. And those are not the same thing. Those are the students that you're going to get. Those that don't, those that can't. So how do you handle that? Because those that could and did, those went to a four-year institution. Those that could afford it went to a four-year institution. Those who are free to do so went to a four-year institution. So if you're in a rural school, such as myself, I'm in the middle of a desert. You know, we've got 25,000 people in my area. The people that, that are coming to the community colleges, one, may or may not have graduated from high school. They need a job, so they need job training. They're not looking to go into a, to a master's program in research and biochemistry. They are looking to get a job to support their family that they already have. They may have one or two kids. They may have a mortgage. Okay? They're supporting somebody. They're a dependent. Those are not the same types of students. Okay? So the faculty between those two institutions are going to be very different because of the different types of training and the different types of preparation that you have between the two. We also have mentorships. The facilities are going to be different and adaptation. So when you're building your lesson plan, try to take into a, to account all of that background that I just gave you. Where are they? Who are they? Where are they going? What are their overall goals? Okay. Go to the next one. All right. So learning outcomes. I, I, I say I borrowed this from Dr. Flores. I literally just stole it. I copied it right over. It is plagiarized. But by the end of the term, the student should be able to look at all of these things. They should do all of it. It's not just should they be able to remember about halfway through. No, they should be able to remember, understand, apply, analyze, and evaluate every single thing you teach. All of it. Okay. The evaluation portion, you do a little bit more of it because uh, you, you do, excuse me, you do a little bit less of it because as you are trying to remember, you can't remember all of those little details. That's where the understanding comes in. If you're going to stand, understand it, then you can apply it in different areas. And that's the benefit. Learning one science, those of you who have taken, you know, your, your, you know, biology or your chemistry, whatever, I'm not entirely sure whatever that is studying. But as you study that, you could see that it started to fill in gaps from other areas. So applying that, analyzing, synthesizing it, being able to pull those, those uh, little details here, there. Oh, that's how that works. I wonder if it will work in this area. That's literally research. The students here at a two-year institution may not realize that until afterwards. Okay? So remember the basic concepts, 
know what those methods are for getting the message across, both to students and to, as new faculty members. What do you need to remember about the institution? Okay. Understand the basic principles. What are we trying to do here? Can they guess what the next step is? Can you set that out? Can you make a kind of a flow chart? Okay. Apply those procedures, of course. What are the students trying to do in life as a career? What are you trying to do? If you're trying to be an instructor, how do you apply what you've been learning in all of these you know, meetings and, and you know, um, I don't want to say pedagogy just yet, but pedagogy. Every time you've been somewhere, somebody has been teaching you how to teach. What were you supposed to apply there? Okay. That is a big question. Okay. So then analyze your results. After you teach something, how do you know whether or not you got it right? Because you may have thought, wow, this lecture is amazing. And then you realize very quickly it was not. Like nobody got it. And they all look at you dumbfounded. So, I mean, yes, if you are singing and the entire audience is stunned in silence, that is, that's pretty awesome. But when it's your students, something is wrong. Okay, I'm a realist in this situation. When your students leave and go, I have no idea what he was talking about. So try to rephrase at the end when you are trying to find out, can they analyze it? Ask them what questions they have, not if they have questions. They have questions. They just don't know how to ask them. Okay. So, and then evaluate it. Evaluate not only yourself, but evaluate your students. There are different ways to evaluate that. We have quantitative and qualitative, of course. Qualitative, can they tell you about it? Quantitative, can they write it all down? Can they answer a question about it? You know, Scantron. Scantrons are good for certain things. I don't have any multiple choice questions in any of my classes. They are all short answer. They can write an essay if they want, but they're all short answer. That allows them to either point themselves to death or prove that they know it. They've got to prove that they know it. They can pull things out here or there. Anything they get wrong, I just mark it out. I don't count it against them. So the more they know about it, the more they try to get that foundation. That shows me that they are evaluating where it's coming from to see if they can apply it. And if they can get it and they finally get on that thought, it just keeps going. I know that they've got it at that point. A Scantron can't do that. go to the next one. So the student body. When you get to a community college, if you decide to teach at a community college, the student body is often non-traditional. They have work experience and they also know they don't want to do that. It doesn't matter what it is. They have been working as a tiler. They have been working as somebody who has, has beaten their body to death for 30 years. So as a non-traditional student, I will look out in my anatomy and physiology lab and roughly half of them will be my age. So they'll be somewhere between 40 and 50 years old. That's half of my students are somewhere between 40 and 50. That is not the same type of student as somebody who just got out of college or excuse me, got out of, of high school, starting college, starting their master's degree and so on. Those are not the same students. They also may not know what is out there. Because remember, they've been focused on their family, their family life. They've been focused on staying here and staying stable, like get the mortgage paid. So they may not know what's out there. They don't even know what a physiologist is. They don't know that that's a thing. Okay? So understand that your non-traditional students may not look like you. They may look exactly like you. I never thought that I would teach people that, that looked exactly like me, sounded exactly like me, and had the same background. It happens all the time. Okay. Now, I've, I've titled these talented but limited and an unlimited yet but an experienced. So talented but limited. Financial freedom is not common for a lot of community colleges students. They did not grow up with wealth. If they did, they would have gone to a major university and moved away. Like, that's, that's as real as I can get about it. They work. They have families. They can't afford to leave. They're here. They do come from limited means, but they absolutely know how to do the job. So don't think that just because they're at a community college that they can't read because some of them can. They just can't afford to go somewhere else. There is, other than UTPB, which is an hour and 15 minutes from where I live, there is no major university around. 
So can you imagine driving for an hour and 15 minutes, one direction every day for classes that may or may not meet? So they come here for their basics. We have the ACGM that tells you know, what is going to transfer and so on. I'll talk about that just a bit later. But they get their classes here. They work with the same students that we are. Okay, so sometimes they, they have lab partners who have never read a book in their life. Others, they know exactly what they do, what they want to do, they know how to do it. And because they are, are roughly inexperienced, but they have the ability to, to do the work, they come here and it's relatively inexpensive. It costs one third to go to a community college or a two-year institution than it does a university. So they are looking at it from a financial standpoint. They don't have time to mess around. So going with those non-traditional students, I would say they were probably the best students I have ever had in my life because they know they don't have time to mess around. If they get a bad grade, they, if they start performing badly, something is very wrong. Okay? So the difference between the talented and, and but limited is the unlimited but unexperienced or inexperienced at the same time. Students often have time so those that are relatively young that don't have family, you know, depending on them right then, but they may not have any real world knowledge. They don't know what's out there. They could not test into a four year program, even on their very best day, simply because they did not have a good foundation to begin with. So they start off with developmental coursework. They're inexperienced. They don't know that algebra is a thing. And I know you're looking at me thinking there is no way that these people exist. We've got colleges all around here that are full of students like that. It is our job to bring them up. So if you think, wow, that would be a strain, like I want to go into research, I admire that absolutely. Imagine how many more researchers we could have if somebody would actually put in the work to bring them up, give them the opportunities and so on. So driven and financially responsible, community colleges cost about an average one third of what a university is. So imagine having one third of the student debt with the same amount of hours and all of those hours will transfer. We have articulation agreements and so on. Uh, I know that Howard College has those with UTPB because I wrote them. Uh, I know that we've got them with Sol Ross because I wrote those and the ones with ASU, Angelo State University. Uh, tech will not, <laughs> I've tried, but no, they won't. Um, but we have those articulation agreements that is the reason why we have the ACGM, which is the Academic Course Guide Manual. We actually have a set of rules that we have to follow. So there's a, a little bit more structure for community colleges than there are for universities. Universities, you have huge amounts of leeway in what you can teach as to why you can teach it and so on. Well, at a community college, it is set. If it's not in the ACGM, you're not teaching it. Okay? So you have to have a passion about what you're doing, of course. So the students know the value of their education and it is right here at home. Okay? So community colleges also have smaller groups. Our student body, you know, there'll be 15 to 30 students in a single class. I teach the second version of all classes like ANP2 and, and Bio2 and Chemistry2 and so on. And my classes normally have somewhere between 12 and 15. Now you've been in classes most likely that have had 300 in one lecture hall. No, you look across and there's just a sea of people. Like, I don't know any of those here. They will know you, they will know your shoe side. They may actually steal your driver's license. Not really, but it, it becomes very personal. I went to EPC, it was that, yes, yes. In fact, EPCC is on campus right now for our baseball. So I was looking forward to seeing the end of that game, but I'm here. I'm okay with that. I'll catch up later. All right, so course content. With that, outline your plan. Stay the course. You can get you know, onto a tangent very easily. I know you can. I have ADHD. I know I can. I've seen me do it. Okay? But what that does is once you, are, you have that schedule set, you can say, all right, I did not get to finish this lecture today. You need to finish this at home. This is your homework. Just finish the lecture. Record it early. You can do Zoom. That part's relatively easy to do so, and they will do so. But add some kind of modules that will either work or drive you know, some part of that discussion, whatever you're trying to do. You can then modify or eliminate those things that don't work. There is no problem. I, 
hundreds of books back here. There are lots of things that work and lots of things that don't. Guess which one outweighs? The things that don't work, there's a whole lot of those, but at least we tried. That's the best part. So grow the exposure, don't grow the exam. Give them as much information as you would like them to have, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to test them on all of the minutia that you were talking about in your class because that can also become a negative experience. And what we try to do is, uh, we're not trying to get rid of bad grades, of course, that's, that's not a thing. I can promise you, not everybody passes my class. I have plenty of F, F, Fs and FX. That means failure due to absences. But what people will do is they will eliminate the negative. If your class is one of those that they, they cannot see over the hump, like you can't guide them up. You can't say like, hey, I can help you get through this. Let me help you. If you get to that point, like you don't have time for that. You've just grown your exam. You've worked more as a weed out than anything. They will eliminate themselves from that class. That's not necessarily a good thing. Okay. Yes, we have all struggled in certain classes. Some of you may have flown through, but what we want to do is get them to a point where they can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Just get them there, get them to that point and they're good, okay? So what that does is brings in our teaching strategies, potentials for a, at a community college and then experience in the activities as well. So what are our faculty goals between the two? At a community college, now I've taught for university and I've taught for community college. Community college, I find that the instructors are more teaching oriented. That is what they do. They get up in the morning and they've got their lesson plan all ready to go. Okay. That lesson plan may be 16 weeks long, it may be eight weeks, it may be four and a half weeks, but they've got their lesson plan set. Whereas at a university, they've got, uh, sometimes they've got a lesson plan, but they are focused on their research. And today I am not going to be in the classroom because I'd like to really get this NMR to work. Those of you at UTPB, I help build those. I know how they work. And I know that Dr. Robinson and I broke a few of them. Ask Milka. Excuse me, Dr. Montes. <laughs> All right, so less research, more experience. The experience that we have when you're working at a community college, we do research. There's just less of it. That is not necessarily our focus. We can do that running in the background. Okay? So we have programs that assist, uh, that assist those students with whatever their long-term career goals are. Okay? We take people who one can't read or can't do math and so on, put them in developmental courses, get them up to that point so that they can get a job. We are job oriented. Okay? So the faculty develop relationships with the other institutions. If somebody wants to go into chemistry, I know to send them to Dr. Montes. There are other institutions, of course, but I know that I can call her on her cell phone and say, hey, I've got a student. Oh, send them over, send them over. bring them over, bring them to me and I can hand them over. And I know that that's the career goal they're going to be on at that point. So what we try to do is develop that relationship with other institutions. I mentioned that with the um, articulation agreements. Students come here and sometimes they don't know what they want to do. They find some type of inspiration while we're here. And then they'll say, hey, can you help me? I want to know more about this. So you function more as a guide than a guru. Okay? So be a guide, always be a guide. Whether you're teaching at a community college or teaching at a university, always be a guide. You already know the path. You've been down it. So the student development, the faculty want to get students up to speed when you're teaching at a community college. Oftentimes, we don't see that in universities, not because it doesn't happen, but because the instructors don't actually get into the class until the second, third, fourth year. That first year, it may be developmental. That happens quite often. Uh, that may not have been your personal experience, but I know that I, I had a few of instructors I never actually saw my first year at UTPB. I saw a couple of TAs here and there, but that was about it. But what we do here at a community college, we are right there. We may be one-on-one. -on -one. We have classes that are three and four and five people, but we are teaching them basic life skills. Those basic life skills will then set them up later on for success. Okay? So remember that not all students show up in the first day with any type of preparation for coursework. There is no history. So remember to teach your first class, not your last class. So faculty at community colleges are doing the heavy lifting a lot. 
the students don't have anything. They have no background, they have nothing built on. So it is our job basically to inspire and motivate. Those are not the same thing. Inspiration means that you're gonna to try to, in, uh, to, to get them to do something for a positive. Motivate makes them do something to get rid of a negative. But because of that, often you get a thankless job. Make sure you thank your instructors, all of them. <laughs> University community, all of them, just send them an email saying thanks. You, that's it. You don't even have to be more specific. Just thank you. Thank, now, don't say if you don't actually mean it, but try. So our teaching strategies that we use, we have two different types. We have pedagogy and andragogy. Has anybody heard of andragogy yet? Hopefully, this is where you are uh, if you're in graduate studies. I'm assuming most of you are. Pedagogy is where you have an instructor, you have some student, it's a dependent personality, and I, and I borrowed that definition from the University of Illinois. It's the difference between the lecture and lab. So a lecture, you've got an instructor standing at the front showing his PowerPoint presentation, doing his thing or her, and then you've got a student that's just absorbing all of that information on a pad of paper. Like, this is how I do whatever we're trying to do. Andragogy, on the other hand, this is where the student desires more information. This is pretty much where you are right now. It is self-directed learning. This is what you are interested in. You found out that there was a program that would accept you into science. We'll just say chemistry. And now there is nothing come hell or high water that will stop you from learning more about chemistry. When you get a, a, a student to the point where they want to know more about their subject, you cannot stop them. Okay? I, I would kind of dare you to try. They will remove you from the situation and then continue to learn more about it. So it's more about personal investment. You see an interest, a personal interest in this more so than just a career. The career is a secondary benefit. Those of you who are going into chemistry, you may work in, in uh, academia. You may go into private. You may go into government research. All of those are perfectly fine, but nothing is telling you straight up like this is how you become a government employee researcher at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. It is giving you the opportunity to do so. This is what your education is doing. Same thing working at community colleges and universities. We have a secondary benefit of having that career because we've got all of the experience and the knowledge that goes along with it. And we want to continue studying that and developing it, sharing it and so on. So remember those two, pedagogy and andragogy. Don't leave anybody behind. I know that's a bit cliche, but you've got a student who's really struggling. Again, just get them there. Get them within arm's distance. They'll see the goal, and then they will find out that andragogy is working for them perfectly. So what is the potential of teaching at a community college? I absolutely love my job. They'll ask me all the time, why do you do that? Like, you could teach pretty much anything anywhere. You could teach any science at any of the universities. I don't want to. There's nothing wrong with them. My personality fits more at a community college. It's simply because we have the ability to move vertically and horizontally uh, which is just a few years of experience. So one semester you may be, and I'm gonna say just an instructor. I know there's a lot more than, than that, but you may be instructor and the next year you may be elected as chair or appointed as a chair or a dean, or you may move into a grant position, horizontal, vertical. You may get a, a pay rise. Normally it doesn't come down, of course. Uh, you may be a director of a particular program or so on. There are so many different ways and avenues that you can work at a community college that you may not see elsewhere. You do the same thing when you're looking at a lesson plan. What are the potentials for your lessons plans working at a community college? Things change a lot. And when I started working here, we had a huge ropes or safety course that was for being able to, <laughs> sorry, I got to say, thanks Dr. Flores. Um, we had a, a ropes safety course for all of our windmill technology that was growing around this area. Well, now all the windmills are up. Should we have a huge safety course again? Should we be, you know, putting more and more and more students in ropes courses if there are no ropes to use? So this is literally safety while mountain climbing on a windmill that's moving. Okay, so the workforce changes constantly, consistently, okay? So fast adaptation, it is never a dull moment working at a community college. 
ever. They will call you up and tell you, hey, we've got to adapt. This new thing is coming up. What are we going to do? Okay. So with that, set your schedule. Never surprise new learners ever. Nobody likes pop quizzes. Nobody likes surprise exams like the exams today. Give them some time because you don't want a chance for them to harm their performance. You can give them a pop quiz and I'm not like, I'm not knocking that at all because you want them to drive that forward, of course. I have assessments every weekend for my students from Friday until Sunday. They're available. They're open book, you can do them at home and I don't mind, whichever, I don't care. But what that does is help them to stay on top of things. They can get the answers. They can get the information and you know they've been exposed to that information. However, see, those position possibilities are also mentioned by Dean. Yes. So if you give them a grade on something that you've surprised them with, it gives them the ability to feel defeated. Some of you have had that before. Have you ever taken a quiz or a test where you were just blindsided and you just thought, wow, I... Maybe this isn't for me. That is very defeating. It's deflating, if you will. Okay. They will also be motivated to stop that negative, which means they're just going to quit. If you keep hitting them with no chance of actually getting more um, benefit out of their performance, they will stop. You become more of a problem than a benefit. And we don't want that, of course. So you want to inspire creative solutions as well, even if that means you have to schedule around your life. Get a planner. It's free on Microsoft. Like, I just I just steal it from my internet or steal it from the the uh, schedule that we find in our email. It's relatively free, but get a daily planner and teach your students to do that as well. Mark it all down, set the schedule, and leave it there. If there's an exam date, leave the exam date outside of you know, snow days. So make it a continuous experience as well. Carry all of that information from one day to the next. When you finish a lecture, you pick up right there the next time, unless you're going to shift chapters or something like that. So continuity allows for review. You can say, hey, last time we were talking about electric fields, and this time we were going to talk about moving through electric fields. Why is that important? In which direction can those things move at that point? Outlook, Google Calendar, link it. Yes, link it to your phone. That way you always have an alarm. Spend time recalling the previous information, just a basic review, and that will also uh, allow you to encourage any questions about that experiences. Where did you see this in life? Where can we see this in life? If you're driving around, you're talking about electric fields and happen to be in physics or something. You know, every now and then you'll see a pipeline that has stuck up out of the ground. It's got a little, you know, knob on top of it, and it goes back down on the ground. There's an electric field that passes between those two that allows us to detect flow. Somebody drives by with their, their detector and they pick up that type of information. You can see the same thing on your water valves today. It started big and went smaller. Like, oh, I always wondered what that truck was doing out in front of my house. It gave them a, the ability to apply the information. So when you're looking at um, the differences between community colleges and universities in this case, the, the differences are vast. The application is the same. Pick up where you left off, small review, and then move forward. And you're going to do the same thing next time. End your, your class with a question each time. Get them to think about it. That way they're thinking about it until they see you the next time. So the different types of activities that we can do, they can be guided. Like you're trying to get them from point A to letter D. You are guiding their little path here. You're letting them stray a little bit here or there. That's what, what labs are really good for. Or it can be problem focused. How do we get from A to B? Because I don't know. That is research. Now, research, when you are doing an active research in the lab, we don't know the answer. When you're doing a guided activity, you already know the answer. You just have to get them there. But they have to experience the same process that you did as you were going through it. Now, you can do homework, of course. Now, together, you can do it as a group. Personally, I couldn't do that when I was going through school. I have students now, they love their group work. So I kind of hash it out about halfway. So together as a group or individual. Those that are individuals can do their work and shine. And you can pick those out. You can pick it up saying, you were doing very well in this class because of this. Have you ever considered a you know, a research opportunity. Have you ever considered going into, I don't know, physics and so on? 
So you can start tailoring their career as they're moving through. Another part that I'm seeing is that at, at uh, some of the instructors that I have that also work at universities, they have synchronous and asynchronous courses. And we here at the community college have both. They have one or the other. So we have Zoom classes here at the community college. Zoom classes, we meet synchronously. We meet at the right time, at the right place, online. It is you and I. We are doing our thing just like you and I are doing today. We also have asynchronous. So you recorded it all previously. You set it up so that it'll run itself. You go in once a day, make sure that all the emails and things like that have been checked, all the, the exams are ready, and so on. So you see the difference between a Zoom class, which is, is virtual, at the same time versus some kind of recorded lecture. And I have students that, that are in both types of my classes and those that fit stay and those that don't ask to switch because I give them the opportunity within the first two weeks. And if the synchronous class is not for you, switch to the asynchronous and you can do it on your own time. If you're asynchronous and you really need an instructor to help you, go to the synchronous course. I don't mind. But you don't know, and it shouldn't harm you if you don't know what your learning style is. You've never been exposed to it before. So that's, again, where adapt, uh, adaptation comes in. Help sessions with added information for clarification, especially just before an exam, really help students. It helps them with their jitters. It helps them with their anxiety, just a little bit, to know that you're actually there. It doesn't matter if it's synchronous or asynchronous. Be there. Be open. Give them your office hour and say, hey, I'm going to be here on a Zoom, it's going to be completely open, even if you hate it, still make yourself available. They can walk right into your Zoom file or your Zoom recording, whatever it may be, and you're there. Hi, I have a question about number four. What can I help you with? Okay. So, and then deep dive into the related uh, but separate areas of whatever you are talking about. If you're doing basic biology, go into something, you know, but once or twice a semester about things like, I don't know, um, oh, I completely drew a blank on what I was going to say. Huh. Anyway, DNA profiling, use that one. You may not be talking about DNA profiling for the rest of the semester at all, but it gives them the ability to see that there's more stuff out there. They're hearing about jobs and they're hearing about experiences that you may have had or know about that they have never known existed. Okay. So coursework can be adapted and then points to consider here. Adaptation. That is an absolute must. Anytime you're doing a, a plan, make sure you can adapt it because never does it go right. I would love to say that it does and it's going to be hundred percent perfect. I would love that. I'm a realist though. I know that it almost never does and that's okay. okay. And then assessment and feedback, ebb and flow versus apprehension. So let's look at those. So adaptations are a must. Community colleges change quickly. We adjust with the workforce as much as others would like to disagree with me and I'm okay with that. The general study side of a community college teaches workforce students. Those that we have in biology are going to become nurses and dental hygienists and so on. It is rare that somebody comes to a community college that is not already career minded as they know what they're going to do. They came here because we have a program. Our program here has a 100% pass rate. That doesn't mean everybody who got in passes. It means everybody who gets to the exam passes. Okay. So they try to focus on the jobs, but the jobs change in our area. We've had, you know, booms and busts due to oil. That may have been an experience that you have in your area as well. They may not have a particular job because one particular area may have you know, more health care than another. Okay. Here in Big Spring, which is surprising to, to most that are in places like Midland and Odessa, we have more health care facilities in Big Spring. That's a little surprising to some. Like, there's no way we have a VA hospital, we have our hospital, and we have specialists in multiple areas that you cannot find in Midland or Odessa. Okay. Because of that, we have to be able to adjust and change rapidly according to what's moving in and moving out of the area. So if they can't get a job or they can't get placement into a program after they take our program, are we truly serving our population? And if the population changes, we have to as well. 
Okay. So budgets rise and fall as well. I would love to say that it is, but it is never a windfall. When you get your budget each year as an instructor, you're gonna think, wow, that is, that is sad. And when you get your grant, everything is wonderful for a bit, for that, at least for the first year. And then you get into your fourth year like, oh no, they haven't approved anything yet. I'm running out of funding. Okay. So there's always a drought when it comes to funding. Be very careful there. Okay. But at community college, I remember that we're teaching oriented. We don't have a whole lot of research funds coming in. That doesn't mean they don't exist. They're just pretty rare. Okay. Now, because we are also teaching oriented, we will teach somewhere between 15 and 18 credit hours every semester. You say, wow, that's a lot. It is. But we are also not doing things like active research in a lab. We are not writing grants, grant applications, and so on. We are then involved everywhere else as well, trying to develop these students. So get involved, of course, but don't stretch yourself too thin. Learn to say no when you can. Okay. The tax-based funding is a catch-22 because that's one of the, the stool legs that fund institutions, taxes. We have taxes, tuition, and then donations. When the tax base goes up, those that are around you that have been now been taxed, they get very unhappy and want that to come back down. But when the taxes go down, the school struggles to meet the needs and they're like, what's happening at your school? Why aren't you funding this? And you have to explain that to them. So sometimes you become a specialist in something you have no idea about. So you get a crash course in taxation anytime you have you know, any type of, of conversation with those in the general public. Get involved, that way they can see what kind of things you're doing and it will be well worth it. So work with every resource that you've got. Develop those relationships with other institutions. Don't hesitate to ask. Somebody may have already had the solution. They've already figured it out and they can show you what to do, but you won't know and they won't know that you're struggling unless you ask. The mentorships. Something that I, that I implemented when I started working here at Howard in 2012 was a faculty mentorship program. Every new faculty member gets a new peer. They get a faculty mentor that is not a boss. It's somebody who is not a supervisor. They can go in and say that, like, I have a question and I know it's kind of dumb, but I don't know who that lady is over there. Imagine trying to say that you're a new employee and you're like, you're, you're trying to build your reputation and so on. And all these new people are coming by and who is Sharon? So on. But the mentorships are, are voluntary. You do that on your own time. You need their source. You need their information. Go and talk to them. Okay. So as you become a, an instructor, please find a mentor. You can have one appointed or you can have one that, that has been recommended, but just go and ask, will you be my mentor? You seem to know what you're doing. You find out that your mentor is not really helping a whole lot, ask somebody else. There's no problem with that at all. Think, okay? because now you have two people that'll say yes. But mentor, uh, mentorships teach new faculty, basically, how do you faculty? How do you do the actual job, not just teaching? Okay? So how do you perform the job of a professor as well as a member of the staff? So where, where do you do whatever you're going to do? Where's the copy machine? I have a printer. Yeah, that prints to that, that office down there kind of thing. And then who is that? And it is absolutely lifelong. Absolutely, 100%. I still have my mentors. At every institution that I have ever worked at, I still have my mentors that I talk to relatively on a, on a relatively constant basis. Okay? And I've been doing it for about 20 years. It's a long time. Okay? So they're good friends at this point. But campuses are typically smaller when you look at a community college. So our entire college has 3,500 students. That may be one online class at UTEP. But we're in your space. That's a good thing, a bad thing. You're in our space as well. The reason why I mentioned that you're in our space and we're in yours, it's, it's, a, it's a family group. And at major universities, you may have you know, a school of electricity or electronics or whatever, pick one. We'll just say the, the school of chemistry. And that's the only faculty you ever come across. 
Here, I'm housed with the wall that is right here. That is our history instructor. The wall that's right here is our math instructor. Totally different areas, but close together. We are right here. We see each other every day. We know what's going on. We're not trying to be in everybody's business. We are everybody's business. If you're struggling, how can we help you and so on? So people really do care. You can feel it. Uh, we want you to be successful, whatever your career goal may possibly be. I want you to be as successful as possible. Okay. So find a mentor. Dr. Hobbs, quick comment. The mentor-mentee relationship is also very visible at the community college level. There's initiatives. I know that um, as emerging faculty, sometimes the, the faculty with more seniority or more rank, um, they automatically take the new faculty under their wing and there's this, this communication or setup through the department. But think about this also in your own life. It doesn't have to be... Um, precisely an institutionalized effort. And once you see this, you'll realize that you've been in mentor mentee relationships for most of your academic life. So this shouldn't be something that, that seems foreign or sounds um, intimidating for you to take on because you already do it on both sides. Think about being a TA, an RA, a peer leader, big brothers, big sisters, or little, I don't remember the full name. There's many, many initiatives. Think about community service. If you do anything with your faith, um, what are the roles and the areas where you have already taken a mentee under your wing or, or where you still continue to go back to that faculty member from two years ago that really helped you develop your recommendation letters or your statement, you know, what roles and what, um, what, what's the amplitude of that role and how you can take on or you have already taken that. I think that's important because sometimes we think of mentors as this elevated concept outside of ourselves. And if you think about it, you've already done it before. So just make sure that you have this back and forth nurturing because it can become a very positive and lifelong or career long experience. I could not have said that better. Good job. Thank you. All right, so for our, our assessments, we actually have an academic course guide manual. It's the ACGM that I mentioned earlier in the, the meeting here. Those are our student learning objectives. We are told you have to meet these particular criteria for this class to count and it will then transfer for credit at the other institutions. Well, the ACGM tells us what their, our student learning objectives are, but they don't tell us how. So you may have nine SLOs, you need to meet all nine SLOs and prove it, but how you do that is up to you. So what I use and I found that most effective is a pre and post assessment. I do one the very first day. It's not for a grade, it's just for me to find out where they are. And I do it on a, a kind of a sliding scale but it is the difference between understanding something and memorizing something. So I asked the same question a different way. The first time that I asked the question, they've never seen this information before. They are supposed to get it wrong. Imagine if they got it right. And then later on the semester, they got it wrong. That looks like your teaching went downhill. So what we do is we give that, that pre-assessment. It gives us a baseline. Where are they today? Then we expose them to the information, teach them that, and then ask the question just slightly different. Can they extrapolate the information and then apply it? Because that was, again, the very beginning. That was one of our goals. They can't memorize that part. It's not a fact to memorize. Unfortunately, too often, uh, students think that things like science that we are teaching is something that you just memorize rather than a process. Okay. So can the students synthesize that information? Can they get to that point? Can they analyze the data that you've given them? and come up with an actual conclusion that matters. Okay? And then quantify versus qualify. Oftentimes you wanna time crunch things like I have to get my grades in on Tuesday, I'll give them a, a multiple choice exam, here you go. There is a difference between a multiple choice question and a multiple answer question. Now I'm not saying give them 50 MACAs because that's horrible. You actually give them you know, 200 questions. But it does allow you the ability to use, you know, a, a basic ABCD format, but it also gives you the ability to register whether or not they can pull out all of the information. One is something they can memorize. The other, they have to analyze and extrapolate, if that makes sense. 
Okay? Or you can do just one-on-one, -on -one. talk with them, have them come by, see what they're doing, give them a, a verbal quiz and so on. Can they explain something? If they do, give them the credit, of course. They don't, you don't, you don't have to correct their score that way, but it gives you the ability to talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. That's very difficult to do in a class of 150, but it does give you the ability to find out where are they? Quite literally, mentally, where are they? Are they prepared for this? Okay. Now, facilities are often lacking on community colleges, and I don't want you to, to take that as a bad. They can be found. It is relatively rare that you have a state-of-the-art state research facility on a community college campus. Okay. That is not our primary goal. Our primary goal is get them to the point where they can go to a university and be successful. That is our goal. Okay. So facilities can be adapted for multiple purposes. Because of our change ability, our adaptability on community college campuses, um, we have to be able to share spaces, and we do. There are rooms that are shared by nursing, and there are rooms that are shared by industrial production technology. Same classroom. And there's no way they could happen in my lab. It's something that happens here. This is why I say it's never a dull moment. Okay? So often it's forgotten that we teach workforce students. Don't forget that part. Uh, so we teach the workforce uh, division's students so that they can be successful. They are depending on you to make them successful. So you're helping them to step up. So space is limited, of course. However, the potential is absolutely unlimited because we can change, we do. So we share rooms, we share buildings, at time we share faculty between one department and the next. So you have a huge potential there. Community colleges have a history of serving the general population. That is what we do specifically in our area. Okay. So you can have a job in your area. We can then build your skills and make it better. Do what you can where you are with what you have. You may have heard this before. That is quite literally how community colleges came to be. There is an ebb and flow when the, when the workforce changes, we change. Okay. So training can be quick. It can be readily available. It can be deployed right then, just a moment's notice, but just a, a week or so. We've got a program for you. So work with a career field uh, developers outside we can then immediately deploy that. I did that when we did on the job uh, training for safety. Okay. So there is a downside, it changes quickly. That's also an up upside. But because things change quickly, I'll give you an example here. We don't teach how to install asbestos shingles anymore. That's not a profession anymore, but we do teach asbestos removal. Okay. So it, the, the workforce changed. Now feedback, both students and faculty, when you're building a lesson plan, they want to know what you need. They will tell you what they need as well. Okay? So you get feedback, not just a grade. You can give them a grade, of course. They are also looking for direction. How do I get where you are? How do I get where you are not? Because I don't want that. I actually had that. I had an instructor. Because of the instructor, I didn't want to do what they did. Honest about that. Uh, inspiration, of course, motivation, getting rid of the negative, having the positive in life, accountability, like hold me accountable. We have a test coming. I have to know this stuff. Quiz me was when, when you see me in the hall. Okay. And then personality, of course. You, you remember your favorite instructor. You know who your favorite instructor was. You may have had multiple, and it had nothing to do with what they taught. You loved what they taught because of who they were. You be that person. Be the one that is just infectious. Be the not not with viruses. Uh, be the one that, uh, that they look at you and it's like, that is probably the most interesting person on the planet. They can speak German and French. It is weird. How do they do that? Okay. Um, you don't have to show off, of course. Just let them know that what you find interesting is interesting. They'll pick up on your passion. And then apprehension. Some of you are thinking, there is no way I could work at a community college jump in, try it, come work for me. Literally, quite literally, if you're a biologist, come, come work for me. Um, water's fine, faculty, students, staff, we are all adaptable. You would be amazed at these students. Again, sometimes we take them, they can't read at all and we make them university ready. Okay? So don't be afraid to grow. Don't be afraid to make some mistakes. I know that's a little bit cliche, but be open to learning. You may learn that your teaching style, the way that you've learned is not the same as the way you teach and vice versa. Okay? So Billy, be willing to say, you know, I've never tried that, but let's find out. That 
science. Hmm. Let's see. Work with an organic system. This is not things that can be uh, changed out like body parts on a car. It's an organic system. It takes time to grow. Okay. And then also one last, stop correcting everybody. I get called Mr. Hobbs all the time and I'm fine with it. You know how many people I've corrected? None. I know I worked hard for it. I'm not worried about that. They're not here for that. What they are here to do is find out how to do whatever you're teaching them to do. Okay. So develop students into those lifelong learners. They will pick up on your personality. Okay. So keep your focus on your students and you'll be just fine. That's right. Thank you so much, Dr. Hobbs. And um, that is very true. The focus and the service, what we do is because and for the students. So to wrap this up, we want to have a, a quick breakout session and some exchange, some thought exchange based on this wonderful phrase provided by our facilitator. And it says, I have loved the stars too fondly to be fearful of the night. So I think that says a lot. And the prompt for this is what are your main concerns about becoming a faculty member? Why is it that you're shying away from the stars? So 10 minutes, everybody, and um, clock is up. So if anybody drops, don't worry, rejoin, and I'll send you back to the room where you were. So time starts now. Have fun. And we are back. There we are. And we really needed another minute here to finish up. Oh my so God. Jessica was in the middle of something very important. The story of our lives. Go ahead, Jessica. We can have a few minutes of open discussion. <laughs> Did you have a point you would like to address for the group? Well, um, Dr. Flores and I, and our group, we were having the discussion about how sometimes the changes that need to be made when preparing for the course are a little bit more rapid than one would want to be fully prepared to teach them. And that is one of my concerns in becoming a faculty member is how to adapt and make sure that you're delivering the best that you can with the short time you have to prepare for them. Um, giving the example that as a TA, I've had to switch gears in the course that I thought without mm -hmm. even having taken that course as an undergrad. So it's been an interesting process. That's where experienced instructors will help you the most. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Hobbs there. Yeah, that's true. Going back to the mentorship piece, um, and also considering that we have this idealized version of our semester, at least for somebody, um, for, for people, uh, I'll speak for myself, but I'm sure that Dr. Hobbs and Dr. Flores and Agni will agree that because we are full-time in higher ed, our life is planned in semesters. Ever since I was a freshman and I continued in higher ed ever since, I never stopped. My life functions in semesters. And we have this idealized version of, I'm gonna have a great planning for the fall and there's never enough time to do that, right? So that's the story of our lives. And, and also the fact that when you are in the throes of it, there's other assessment pieces that are part of the department that are thrown to the faculty. Um, and we have to make time to make sure that we are, that we are uh, completing the slows, for example, at community colleges, um, the evaluations, other meetings that are last minute, things that happen, um, life gets in the way and you have to adapt. So it's part of the same thing. I don't know if Dr. Flores wants to address anything else on this before we um, go to our closing remarks. I would just say that every day you try your best. I don't know of anybody who says, ah, today I really didn't try hard at all. You know, and we all laugh about that. You know, we'll honestly think that we're trying to do our best. So by the end of the day, reflect on that. and say, I tried to do my best. My best was perhaps not the best ever, but it was good. So go to, go to bed 
thinking you did your best, right? And then the next day you say, well, how can I improve, right? And sometimes it's going to be uh, improvement over semesters. It's not going to happen overnight. Okay, so uh, get a good night rest and then in the morning wake up and are ready to face the day. And it's really important to find a mentor, somebody you can talk to about your challenges. So don't just think that as a professor, you're going to be the mentor of students. You also need to be mentored always, right? So you have to have a network of people that will do certain things with you. It's not one person is going to do everything with you. You can find multiple mentors and that's important too. So even if you're a teaching assistant or a peer leader at the undergraduate level, you, you ought to find somebody that will be listen, willing to listen to you and provide the advice that you need, right? And by the way, I'm here for you, right? So just, if you have questions, just you know, let me know. We can get together, we can talk about these things. And we do have, Dr. Flores, we do have several pieces that as a team throughout the years we have produced, not only for Aspire, but for LSAMP that talk about mentoring from the faculty and the administrative perspective. And if you guys are interested, I know it's not like you have extra time to figure out what you want to do with it, but if you're interested in, uh, we can certainly share a few of our articles or things that as a team locally, we have in state uh, level, we have produced for the National Science Foundation who uh, graciously funds us, but also for other conferences and presentations where we're disseminating what we do and they're centered in mentoring. So if that's something that appeals to you, please let us know. And another thing that I wanted to mention is that as you progress in your teaching experience, I recall comparing my, my, um, my lectures from one semester to the other. So if you have a class that you're teaching a core class, let's say an intro class, you have your, your lesson planned and then maybe the following semester, two, three semesters after, you are going to have to adapt and see what has worked and what hasn't for us, a great idea you thought it was. Once you introduce it to the classroom, maybe it didn't really hit the mark, right? So as you go and you progress, you build your portfolio and you improve on, on, on previous lessons. And there's also a chance to share between your colleagues that are teaching the same courses, what are you doing to tackle this specific issue? But that doesn't happen until you're actually doing it. So that's going back to what Dr. Hobbs was mentioning. You have to jump into it and just, just try to be as fearless and, and confident as you possibly can with the resources you have at that moment. Dr. Flores. Thank you. Are we on concluding remarks? Yes, sir. Okay, well, I just want to thank Dr. Uh, Hobbs for uh, being our guest speaker today. We truly appreciate the time uh, that he has dedicated to, uh, to this. And we have now a beautiful presentation, PowerPoint slide deck that we uh, are going to share with everybody. I think Sara has already done that. And, and if you have any questions, by all means, if you want to uh, address to Dr. Hobbs, you know, you can always reach him through us, or if he wants to share his email, he can always do that as well. But the bottom line is just think about when you're preparing your lesson plans, when you're thinking about how to be inclusive in your teaching, uh, realize this, this is always going to be work in progress. You know, every time at the end of the semester, I'm always thinking, oh, I could have done this, I could have done that. And then the next semester, I encounter myself with a new set of students who are at very different levels. They're not the same students. You can't go back in time and teach the same stuff or teach it better because you have a different set of students. So the most important thing that you can do is realize that change is inevitable. Students are always going to be changing and you're going to be changing too. So you are going to improve over time. You're going to do things better. Give yourselves that time. Don't, don't think that, it's that, that you're doing the wrong thing by not giving yourselves 
you know, all the time in the world to prepare for a class. It's just you progress over time. So once again, Stephen, thanks so much You're for your words of wisdom. And uh, we will be in touch with you, right? You know, you have our contact information. If you have any questions at any given time, we'll be more than glad to answer your questions. And I wish you a great weekend. Next week, we're going to start getting ready for finals. Some of you are probably really nervous and just gasping for air. It'll be okay. Okay, just take a deep breath. Have a cup of coffee on me. <laughs> and we'll be in touch. Thank you so much, everybody.